which is probably hit cards, and then just hit it. I, I have just hit it. Um, yeah, hello again, everyone. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Ernest Durbin, who is also PyCon's chair this year. Uh, and <laughs> He's going to talk with us about running vintage software, IPI's aging code base. Okay. Alright, can everybody hear me all right? Excellent. Um, if you are watching the sort of thing that's blasting past on screen, you might have understood uh, the theme if you can read quickly. Um, so this is uh, running vintage software, PyPI's aging code base. Um, I'm Ernest. W. Durbin III, and a little bit about me. Um, I'm a software person. I live and work in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, since about 2012, I've been contributing to Python Software Foundation's infrastructure team. Uh, I'm an avid taco enthusiast, um, but recently, much of my free time has been uh, involved with vehicles, which has led me to believe I may be a mass mechanic. Um, and that's because I make every attempt possible to make this car my daily driver in the fair weather. Uh, this was my first car, like the first car ever. Um, it's a 1967 Saab Model 96. Uh, it's one of the last two-stroke powered cars in the United States, which is a fun fact. And I've been servicing, repairing, and trying to improve it since I started driving it in around 2003. Driving a vintage car every day can be a pain. Things will break. Cash will generally be the easiest solution. <laughs> Experts and parts may not be readily available. Engineering assumptions from the 1960s may not be valid at all. <laughs> so is this a lost cause? Like, you know, should we, should we just scrap the vehicle? Um, I could get something far more reasonable um, and give up on the cross. I, I don't think so. Um, and that means that there's only one thing to do, and it's uh, get to work. Uh, oftentimes, we'll just be pulling things apart and cleaning them up. Uh, so, can we pause you for a moment? Sure. We're going to take audio from you. Okay. I do not know. Uh, there we go. Uh, sometimes it's, oh, wow. Yeah. That, <laughs> sometimes it's simple telemetry that needs to be repaired. Um, and once in a while, there's a need for more invasive surgery. Um, during a recent conversation on Twitter about my sob, Hinnick saw the need to interject. Um, he posited that perhaps my being tied up in vintage sobs was indicative of why I might have been tied up in one of my favorite ways to contribute to the Python community. I took time to consider this carefully, and I concluded that Hinnick is not wrong. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about PyPI. It's, it's one of uh, Python's uh, largest pieces of core infrastructure, um, and it's short for the Python Package Index, um, also known as the Cheese Shop. Um, and uh, I've been one of PyPI's caretakers along with a couple other people uh, since uh, sometime around two, 2012. Uh, during that time, I worked with Donald Stuffed and Richard Jones and a handful of other volunteers um, to improve PyPI's availability and keep the lights on. So a little bit of history. Um, PyPI's pr uh, predecessor was this thing called the Vault of Parnassus. Parnassus? Um, and it was a hand-curated page full of links to submit Python stuff. Um, but that's all. It was just uh, links to other pages, um, and, it, and it even included a lost and broken links section. Um, in true glorious 1.0 fashion, it was pure, pure hypermedia. Um, links, were, links were king. It was just, you know, here's where you go to find out more. And there are archives of this still floating around. Um, this is from archive.org, um, and there are a couple other others that are out there. I really encourage everybody to go take a look at it because we've come a very long way. Um, and you know, sort of what's available in the Python ecosystem. And, there's, and a lot of this stuff is still valid. Um, so that was great, and it provided a lot of value. Um, but you know, there's, there was a need for improvement. Um, if you're not familiar with a PEP, a PEP is a Python enhancement proposal. And it's sort of the way that Python and Python ecosystem changes in an official manner. Um, like most core parts of Python's ecosystem, uh, it, PyPI is an outcome of a handful of PEPs. Um, and we're going to go over just a couple real briefly to talk about what they are. So PEP243 uh, described a distutils extension, if you're familiar with distutils, um, to provide to upload metadata about your package to, to a central server. Um, it was ultimately withdrawn and replaced by PEP301. This also described a distutils extension for uploading metadata and include classifiers and um, 
it was eventually accepted and became the PyPI we know today. Uh, for the first few years, it hosted, ah, darn it. So for the first few years, it hosted no files and acted simply as a metadata server, much like the vault of Parnassus. Um, package ho packages were, made, were, were hosted by the maintainers in whatever way they chose. Um, the goal was something more specific and built in to the Python ecosystem than the vaults of Parnassus. Um, uploads and packaging and package hosting were added in the sprints of PyCon 2005 in Washington, D.C. And eventually in 2013, PEP 438 made hosting mode for packages explicit. So you could tell if a package was on PyPI or hosted externally. And finally, in, PEP, in 2014, PEP 470 deprecated external hosted packages. So if you wanted to install something with PIP from PyPI, it had to be on PyPI. Over the years, PyPI has seen a number of changes, but the largest has been the sheer volume of traffic. Um, so PyPI today, Python Package Index, more than 100,000 unique packages, more than 700,000 total releases, about 175 million requests per day, and about 20 terabytes of data per day are served. And there are like three working tests. Um, <laughs> so, so, and I think I deleted two of them the other day. Um, so this is uh, a, a chart just to sort of give you an idea of, for growth. This goes back four years. Um, since we started using Fastly, so it was most accessible. Um, and we've served about 95 billion requests and about 10 petabytes of data. Um, it's an incredible amount of, amount of stuff. Um, so where did this code base come from? Uh, the initial commit uh, in version control started November 1st, 2002. And the first package was actually released just a few days later on November 6, 2002. Uh, this is vintage software. Um, Remember how I said it was just initially, you know, a, a disk utils extension and a, and a, and a metadata index. Um, uh, over the years, it's just added features and sunsetted features and changed a bunch. Um, but interestingly, most of the basic parts of the code base uh, have lived on and been extended or modified to do what we need to do. On top of that, it was built on a one-off WSGI implementation uh, or web server gateway interface uh, implementation which we might scoff at today, but you have to remember back in 2012, or 2002, dang, uh, options were incredibly limited. Trying to operate vintage software every day can be a pain. Things will break. And when they break, people will talk about it a lot, as we remember. Um, <laughs> but not everything's great, and here's all the tweets that, that contain PyPI down since 2009. Uh, there are hundreds of them. Uh, running a service that becomes a core piece of infrastructure for developers who love Twitter can be a challenge. Tools. Um, you know, they, they will speak out and let you know. Uh, tools were built which expected and required PyPI's availability for deployments, continuous integration, and workflows. So what do you do? This is a chart of over the last, since 2009, the frequency of PyPI down in tweets, which I'm, I'm pretty proud of this graph. Like, it, it's going the right direction. So, you know, we, we sort of had to do something to, to provide better, or not we, but in general, the community had to do, do better to provide value. And so PEP381 introduced mirroring infrastructure, which made a lot of the pipe, made a lot of PyPI going down uh, less of a problem. Um, there were some problems with this, though. Um, all these were community hosted. Uh, users would basically say, I have a mirror. Can you give me a C name? And so now you're giving out C names to python.org uh, subdomains to pretty much anybody that just had good intentions at the time. And clients had to change to support it. So you had to explicitly point yourself in a mirror, and that's not always the most convenient. Um, cache is generally the easiest solution with vintage software. Um, the single biggest impact on PyPI's availability and getting better um, and speed and all this stuff is Fastly. Um, uh, they provide reliable installs. You can always just point at pypi.python.org. You don't have to switch to a mirror, so client complexity is, is lowered. There are powerful features for us to change the way that things happen. Um, I really like Fastly, uh, so Fastly, Fastly. Okay, said enough. Um, so there, you know, Fastly made it, made a big difference, but there was a turning point uh, back in uh, 2013 where things really just sort of like came to a came to a boiling point. Uh, there was one VM running in a uh, data center somewhere else. Uh, it was manually managed, so people things had changed and installed everything. It was running on a bespoke, uh, donated piece of infrastructure, and all the support for PyPI was 100% volunteer. Experts in context might not be readily available. Uh, volunteers can't always like you know just say, oh yeah, I'll spend X amount of time talking about you know what you know why this is the way it is and such. 
So eventually we decided to get a little bit more real. Um, we brought PyPI sort of into the, uh, the current age where we're at now uh, with configuration management, high availability storage, high availability databases, uh, multiple web servers, and we were hosted on a uh, hosting provider with an SLA. Um, so whenever we had an issue with infrastructure, we could say, hey, why isn't networking working here? And somebody would answer. Um, and finally, engineering assumptions from 2002 might not be valid anymore. Um, over the years, PyPI grew a bunch of anti-features, in my opinion. <laughs> um, uh, most with very good reason, um, but we're kind of past where they made sense. Um, again, the custom you know, WSGI framework, it works, um, but you know, it, it, it leaves a lot of edge cases to be concerned about that you know, experts in HTTP can probably solve better. There were SSH uploads for a while to get around the fact that TLS wasn't in the sort of golden era we are now with Let's Encrypt and other, other solutions, which meant giving shell access to anybody to upload a package. Um, that is not that great. Um, the real-time download counts were fragile, flaky, and uh, hard, to, hard to believe. Um, so th those have been replaced with uh, Google Bigtable. If, you if you'd like more information about that, which a lot of people do, they miss their stats, uh, let me know, and I'll point you out to uh, an announcement on the Bigtable and how you can access it. Um, there was an open ID provider, an, open, an OAuth provider, and it, for a while used uh, some broken cryptography, now broken cryptography. Um, so a lot of these things have been removed, all but one, um, which will be removed, I think, next like two weeks. So is PyPI a lost cause? Uh, should we just throw it away and give up and do nothing and you can write all your own software? A little, yeah, but not the last part. <laughs> you, 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 should, you should still rely on experts and, and, and other places to, to provide that value for you. You need to be able to install things. Um, one of the biggest drawbacks to PyPI's current code base is that con onboarding new contributors can be a huge pain. Um, a lot of the things we spoke about, the complexity, custom, custom frameworks, very few tests, it's not a very inclusive environment to like say, I'm going to jump in, make a change, and have it reliably deployed. Um, dependencies, database schema, and custom web framework all just make that worse. Um, and they make it, they make it hard to solve uh, problems and, and do new work. So over the last few years, there's been an effort called, on a project called Warehouse. Warehouse is the next generation um, implementation of PyPI. Um, it's a full rewrite uh, with extensive test coverage, documentation both on its functionality and developer documentation. It uses modern best practices in the web world, and it's built with caching in mind. Um, the original PyPI is not, and so there's, which we'll talk about momentarily, uh, which makes some things very difficult. Donald Stuffed uh, has been working tirelessly um, on, on this development, and uh, things are so really progressing. If you've uploaded a package to PyPI in the last like, month and a half, I think, it actually went through Warehouse, not through, Py not through the legacy code base or vintage code base. Um, but these things don't happen overnight. Um, as a matter of fact, Warehouse has been progressed for more than two years. So it's time to put the, 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 old, the old thing on, on life support so that we can work, focus and, and build out the new thing. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few things that I think are critical uh, to make uh, running the old PyPI while we, while we develop Warehouse possible. So a few warnings. Uh, so think concepts here. Um, you know, a, none, none of these specific implementation details will necessarily just be like, yeah, ready to go for your, for your purposes. Um, there is going to be some code on the screen. Don't focus and try to rush to read it as, we, as, like, as it comes up. I'll highlight it as we go. And I also want to note that the goals here are slightly different than your average production system. Um, you know, we're very sensitive to behavior changes here. Um, we need to maintain compatibility with a lot of concerns internally for warehouse. And um, excuse me, I'm just going to catch my breath. And uh, you know, the, we just, there are different goals. And so if you're building something new, a lot of this advice is valid. Um, but I'm, I'm really focusing on what it takes to continue running this. For more information on what to do for something new and like great features, there was a great talk in this room just uh, previous by Brian Pitts, cap Capacity and Stability Patterns. Check that out. The single biggest enabler of effective change for, for, the, for PyPI legacy or vintage PyPI, especially given limited time and resources, have been metrics. Um, these are all about answering questions. Often you'll, notice on, like, often you'll notice a focus on system metrics like CPU, memory, disk, et cetera, which are fantastic. 
However, there's a welcome trend over the last few years in tech towards application level instrumentation. System level metrics are great for answering questions like, what is slowing down or breaking? And did my, did my change help performance or hurt it? Application metrics can, can tell you things like, where are my efforts best spent? And what features may, may, load, uh, what features may no longer be worth supporting? So here's an example. We have a very simple method uh, that calls another method, so it's nice and abstracted and stuff. Um, but it's called a search method, and we want to instrument it. We want to know how often it's being called and how, and how it's performing. It's really easy to change. Uh, there's a library called perfmetrics that I've been using to submit stats dmetrics, and it makes it uh, almost comically simple with decorators. You import perfmetrics, and you decorate your method. Magically, you're suddenly getting these stats dmetrics submitted um, that tell you things like a rate, how often it's being called, um, uh, the count, which is just the raw number of counts per, per, per time slice, um, a count again because of the way stats d works, or uh, uh, the aggregator works. And then you also get these really helpful things, lower, mean, upper, and upper 90 uh, by default. Um, lower being the fastest time in the slice that it, that it executed, mean being the average time, upper being the absolute slowest, and a really important one, upper 90 being the 90th percentile. So up at that very top level, like how bad are things? Um, so here's, a, here's just a really uh, simple uh, thing you can do with this. I can say, what are the t five most time consuming methods um, of it, you know, for, this, for this subset? And it's kind of nasty in graphite, but you can take these metrics and do some math and take the count and the average and say, how much time are my backend web servers spending doing X? And so now you can, you can say, well, there's quite a bit of you know, deviance on this pink one, which is uh, a call to get the, number, like the URLs for release. So we should maybe focus on making that quicker, more, more, more time for the backends to work. Uh, another uh, example, this is uh, another part of search. And you'll see we, do, we, we look at the start time and the end time. This is a little bit more complex because yeah, we can't just decorate it because it's not in a method, but it's like a subset of a method that we want to measure. We, so we can calculate the start, the end time, submit that. Um, yeah, so we do the work in the middle, and now we get this graph, which is, again, the same thing. It's the, it's the timing of those calls. So we can look at it, and say you set a timeout. Um, yeah, so here we, we actually time out the request, um, and so when we're tuning that timeout, it's really important to keep an eye on uh, specifically upper and upper 90 so that we know if our threshold is too low, we're going to have all these timeouts, people are going to have a bad experience. If it's too high, we're not actually going to catch failures. Um, so you can, oh, there, uh, my slide is set. So anyway, so you have the timeout. So now we can chart and say uh, how often did things time out and tune things more effectively to keep an eye, or keep an eye on that. Um, in the same vein, but not necessarily uh, directly related to metrics, uh, capturing and looking at your errors effectively has also been really helpful. Um, PyPI has a lot of errors <laughs> um, of all varying types. Um, and more importantly, uh, since it's hard to reproduce sometimes and since we don't have good tests, it's actually really helpful to have a stack trace and the variables in context and such to, to, to help understand what went, exactly went wrong. So the next thing I want to talk about is, is scaling with what I'm calling tactical updates. Uh, so you know, it's really easy to like, look at a problem and say, we should just throw it all away, rewrite it, and move on. Um, as I've mentioned before, there are very few tests, and so that's a very dangerous proposition. Your chances of deleting code and then re-implementing it perfectly are very low without tests. So here is uh, PyPI's search method. It's a big block of code, but what it boils down to is it generates uh, six, oops, six separate SQL queries that all execute. Um, and if you know anything about SQL, this is uh, really bad news. <laughs> um, so things will catch on fire, it's really bad. So if search is kind of a problem, then why don't we use something a little bit more uh, oriented towards search? Um, so this is a re-implementation, about the same number of lines of code, and most of it's just sort of massaging things back to the, 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 the way that the things that call this method work. And because of how naive the search implementation was, it was actually really easy to implement a naive solution in Elasticsearch that performs 
in, like much better, and the accuracy is within acceptable territory. People complained a lot at first, and then you had to like then I had to learn about Elasticsearch, not just like throw code at a problem. Um, but we got there, and the, the the payback was really huge. So this is um, the the upper. So this is the worst case search time uh, went from somewhere around like one and a half, two seconds to like 250 milliseconds, which is really nice. And more importantly, the, the number of errors uh, that we were serving at the edge went for timeouts and just and just back end overloading dropped off the face of the planet. And so, um, you know, there are some scenarios where you look at a chart like we serve so many 500s, we should stop doing that. And there's no way around uh, making like a concerted effort to do like a tactical change that changes the behavior within acceptable amounts and improves what you're doing. Um, the next big thing is caching. Um, caching is a tricky business. Um, there, and HTTP caching in particular is probably the most successful to most people, um, no matter sort of what you're doing. Uh, HTTP caching is sort of built in uh, to the HTTP protocol with cache control headers. Uh, there are many options you can sort of adjust and tune to your parameters. And it's generally sort of bolt-on. You can put a HTTP cache between sort of an HTTP client and a server almost any time. This guy, uh, Matt Robin, Matt, how do you say your last name, Matt? Robinold. Robinold. Um, he's, I just know him from the internet. Um, has a pretty good talk, Cheating Your Way to Web Scale, that talks a lot about HTTP caching. You should check that out if you want to know more. Um, the long story short of HTTP caching is get a CDN. Um, you, can, you can generally sort of shop this problem out relatively, rel like on relative budget terms uh, cheaply. And if you're going to get a CDN, I might, <laughs> I might recommend Fastly. They're really, really nice to the PSF and PyPI, so I'm just going to keep saying their name. Um, another form of caching is internal stuff. So this is where things get pretty tricky. Uh, it, it switches from you know, out-of-the-box solutions and, um, and, and, and vendors you can pay to having to think uh, a lot more. So as an as a <laughs> example of why caching is hard, um, this is a piece of Puppet source code that was in the Puppet, Puppet code base for uh, many, many years. Uh, it's recently been changed. It's about 18 months ago. But there's, a, there's like one particular problem with it. And it calls uh, the XML RPC, which is a sort of old interface to PyPI, to get the number, of, like the current ver name and version of releases for a given package. Um, so a little bit more about XML RPC. This is a valid XML RPC call. Um, it's kind of wordy, and it, it's, it's very, very well specified because XML. Um, but there's one really, really bad problem about this. This is a totally, this is absolutely just reading. It's a read-only call. You just want some data back, but it's doing a post. Posting is uh, sort of a problem because it makes your HTTP caching concerns much more complex. You have to do... You have to do smarts to try to, to, to cache a post. Uh, it's dangerous as well. Um, in general, uh, maybe this wouldn't be a problem, right? Like Puppet's a pretty popular configuration management framework, but like, you know, I run it on, you know, like a couple servers here or whatever. But Google or uh, somebody at Google's size or similar size uh, has a ton of instances, and they all want to call this method, and it's hard to cache. Um, so we can't do it in HTTP, um, but maybe we can do something a little, a little bit more intelligent. So here is that package releases uh, method um, in the XML RPC. And so the implementation of caching, uh, again, is just a, sort of a decorator that uses uh, something called least recently used cache to look at the method signature and cache that for as long as is appropriate for the package name. And that way we can, without querying the database, we can return the same response and just cheat. Um, this was a pretty big win too. Um, so this is the hit and miss. Hits are blue, misses are green on that. So you know it provides a lot of value because we're not hit, we're not nailing the database, and uh, it, it goes faster as well. Um, another thing is rate limiting. Uh, rate limiting is super important for ensuring that uh, your users are 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 happy. Um, if a single user can come in and ruin everybody's day, it's no fun because not only will that happen, people might act, act, like actively attack you and, 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 and leverage that. So some things that rate limiting can protect you from is spike in traffic from one client, uh, misbehaving or malicious script. Uh, you can use it to prioritize traffic, um, and you can use it to shed load. Uh, 
Um, so you can say that you know these things are not as important. Don't do those. Um, I'm going to talk about the first two since it's what's most most sort of common for PyPI to see. Um, but the other two are really really neat uh, to think about. And Stripe did an excellent blog post about rate limiting. Um, stripecom blog rate limiting If you search Stripe rate, rate limiting, you can read it. It's super solid. Um, so spikes for one client. Um, if you know anything about uh, Linux systems, there's a scheduler called cron that will run a script at a given time at, you know, or a given frequency. Um, again, if a single person's doing that, it's not so bad. But if you have a, like, giant racks of servers um, uh, all running something at the same time, a single IP address or a range of IP addresses can come in really quickly. So rate limiting spikes from one client um, can be super helpful. Uh, it generally manifests as a single IP address or a few IP addresses that all seem to hit you at the same time. Um, and more often than not for PyPI, it's sort of that loathsome XML RPC interface. Um, I think only once I remember uh, where it was a literally like thousands of servers that were all running something at the same time every night. Um, and that's a lot harder to handle. It's effectively a, a denial of service attack or distributed denial of service attack. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to handle that in a moment. Um, and often, oftentimes, uh, this can uh, diagnosing the denial of service attack can be much more complex than just saying, this IP address is nailing me for a long time. Another thing with rate limiting is dealing with misbehaving scripts. Um, so you know, your new PyPI crawler is awesome. And after hacking on it all night, uh, you go to bed, push a new release. And uh, wake up in the morning to find out that all you're getting back are 429s, or the HTTP status code for slow down, you're hurting me. What went wrong? Um, <laughs> it's a common issue with tools that are built with really good intentions, um, but end up calling routes to the back end that are expensive. Um, again, we generally only have to deal with this for uh, XML RPC. Um, so if you want to build a PyPI crawler and get, get data from PyPI, you should use the JSON APIs. Um, which you can find out a little bit more on the, there's a link on the current page um, to tell you about that. So rate limiting, uh, sort of the easiest solution is just to let your, let your web server do it. You can say, you, Nginx, it's pretty simple. You set up a little like configuration for your, your rate limiting, you know, where it's going to be stored. And then you, for each location or each URL, you can say this is exactly how I want to handle it, but you know, how, how much people can get. Um, for application level rate limiting, though, uh, it becomes a little bit more intense. Because like I said, we, you know, we're getting requests. We need to introspect them a little bit to get an idea of what's going on. So this is the actual work of this method. Um, and this is, just the, this is just the code that does rate limiting for the XML RPC right now. Um, so the, the code is actually rel relatively simple, but there's a bunch around it. And so if you're going to do rate limiting, uh, you need to be kind of careful. And so, uh, it's set up as a context manager, so it can be called in sort of a uh, you know simple fashion. You can say with rate limiting, you know, in, or with rate limiting as you know limited or something a boolean. Uh, now you can yield that boolean, and based on the response of this, you can say okay, drop the request or continue. Um, it's really important to log these things. Uh, you you want to sort of understand when somebody comes to you and says, hey, why am I being uh, rate limited? Uh, you can tell them exactly, like, it's well, you know, these are the reasons, and this is when you were rate limited from our side. Um, and fail safe. Uh, if, your rate limiter if your rate limiting code um, fails and either, and like stops everybody from getting, your, uh, getting to your service, it's actually a, a big problem. Um, and then metrics. Uh, again, as with anything, you want to know how effective your change was, and so uh, you should measure, in some, in some broad sense, uh, how things are going. So here's uh, PyPI's uh, metrics for rate limiting from, I don't know, I think a week or so ago. Uh, the blue line is how often the, the methods that are rate limited are invoked. Uh, and then we haven't had anybody over or enforced, so I wasn't able to find a good chart. Um, and this is uh, another part of measuring the errors for the failsafe, uh, how often we have a problem with the rate limiter. And we can note that you know, we're not serving 500s to go along with this. Um, I don't know what that is. Uh, <laughs> so uh, a, a brief aside on ban listing. So you know, automated systems for handling, uh, handling uh, ab not abusive, but sort of misbehaving clients are great. 
But occasionally things are just so broad or uh, it's the first time you've seen it that you like, have no idea what to do. Um, and so this is where you've got to do some like, log diving. You have to sort of uh, play, you know, put your detective hat on and, and find out, like, is this you know, intentional? Is it an accident? Is there a, a pattern to what's, what's sending me all this traffic? Um, so occasionally, uh, PyPI does have a couple switches to make it safe uh, for us to continue like, serving traffic without uh, shutting down for everybody or, or, or failing. So Fastly provides a thing called edge dictionaries. So we can just send a, uh, we can just put a piece of data in a dictionary and Fastly can use it to look up like, is this, is this IP address banned right now? And so this is really useful for banning a single IP address without having, like really quickly without having to think too much about like uh, CIDR notation and such. Um, for more intense cases, uh, they also provide um, edge ACLs. So you can say, I need to ban like this entire <laughs> like subnet. Uh, they're really they're really hurting me right now, um, uh, and uh, rooting features. Uh, this is another thing that's really super duper helpful um, for for running running software. Um, it's really super fun. Um, it reduces your security and error footprint, um, and it also reduces the scope for the new software, the thing that's going to take over for your your old and busted, uh, you know, current 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 system. Um, and it also gives you a migration strategy around that. So as you're removing features, you're able to also maybe re-implement features and start serving from the new from, from your new system along the way. Um, I'm super jealous of Alex Gaynor. Um, <laughs> he found a uh, like giant JSON blob in the PyPI code base, and so he he now has like the number one for deletions. Um, <laughs> And the last thing I want to talk about is simplifying architectures. So this kind of goes in hand in hand with, um, with removing features. But the architecture of your application is also a, a, a large part of your maintenance. Uh, the, the number of systems you depend on and the way that you run them can, can cost you time that, you might, that might be better spent elsewhere. Um, so it's easy to feel like you're running through a murder mystery mansion uh, <laughs> when you're in an older code base. And they tend to be these like giant, uh, you know, sort of downtrodden castles. Um, uh, but, but sometimes it's important to step back and think, like, what are your, what are your core needs? Um, you know, maybe a more modest solution will suffice. So these are a couple things that have been done uh, to, to reduce the architectural overhead of PyPI in the past, um, and also at the same time uh, help us in migrating, uh, or help us in co-deploying warehouse. So we moved file storage from ClusterFS, which was like a cluster of servers that presented a file system, for multiple servers to share, uh, like where, like to, to serve packages to S3. Um, what's nice about that is now we can run old PyPI and new PyPI wherever we want, and S3 is is, is a relatively battle-proven piece of uh, infrastructure. Also, killing the live download counts was huge. Uh, we were running like two or three servers that were just dedicated to handling, like counting how, how often things are downloading and doing it poorly. Um, so now there is a much more rich set of data uh, in Google BigQuery, including like the TLS version that your client installed it with, the Python version, PIP version, um, all sorts of really good things that allow you to understand how your users are using uh, the packages you're hosting. Um, and then the self-hosted Postgres was occasionally a problem, and so we just shipped it off to Heroku because they're really generous and uh, offered us some credits. So to review, um, some things that make uh, Running an invented piece of software possible. Uh, metrics, all the metrics. Uh, making changes with like forethought and and and, and specific, specificity rather than just like, you know, going nuts and rewriting everything um, at at once. Uh, caching, removing features, and simplifying architecture. So, real briefly, I want to talk about how you can contribute. Uh, it's pretty much the main reason I want to give this talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> so here we are. Um, the number one easiest super duper way, everybody should do it if you're if not in production, I guess, but use pypi.org. So pypi is going to move from pypi.python.org into its own domain for a number of reasons. But pypi.org is the new thing now. Um, that, that will be what replaces pypi at some point. Um, and you can use it today to browse, search, uh, etc. And you can also use it for your installs. Um, if you're using it, uh, you can also go look at, uh, you know, uh, if you run into a code issue or an error that you're confused about uh, that you know is specific to the code base, uh, you can go check out 
the, where, the warehouse code base um, and file an issue there or also contribute. Um, Warehouse.readthedocs.io has developer documentation, how to get up and running, uh, how, to, how to use it, how to be excited. Um, and more generally, uh, there, we've recently launched, uh, or not recently, it's been around for a while, uh, a meta tracker for just general Python packaging problems. Um, and so you can also check that out. And lastly, if you're filthy rich and <laughs> just want to throw money at it or your employer does, you can check out donate.pypi.io. Um, it is a super great way <laughs> to contribute. Um, but the big thing is uh, definitely check out the code base. If you're, if you're able to code Python or you want to get started, there are tons of issues that, that, that need to be uh, addressed um, before we can sort of go live. And they vary from everything from really simple fixes to complex things to CSS to templates, et cetera. Um, so definitely go check out the issue tracker. Um, there's pretty much something there for everyone. Um, and uh, that's how you can help. So thank you. Um, I'm Ernest. And are there questions? A couple of slides ago, you had your review. Is that a priority order? Do you think that's the, the, the tackle order? Does it matter what order you do it? You have like metrics. And so, the, so the question is, um, I had the review. And, and, and the, the question was, is that indicative of priority in which you should address those things? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, it, the metrics are definitely what I would call priority one, um, because they, they can be they can be implemented without without affecting the behavior of your code base optimally. Like you know, you could have a syntax error or something, but generally they're they're safe. So StatsD and Datadog's StatsD protocol and most metrics uh, and Prometheus, for instance, they all run out of band, and so uh, you're not making a network call to submit them, or they're, it's over UDP, so it's free. Um, so generally, they won't affect dramatically affect the performance or behavior of your application. So it's, it's almost a free win. So start measuring as much as you can to, to inform your decisions down the line. And that will actually be able to help you change the prioritization there. So the question is, can I elaborate on uh, the, the decision leading up to rewrite from scratch. Um, I wasn't involved in that decision directly. I was kind of just excited to help out with the infrastructure. Um, and I, I think that it was, I think it's well guided. Uh, there's a, a, you know, there was a, a large attempt by Donald uh, to refactor PyPI's code base into Flask Live. And the, the value just wasn't there because, you know, it would have been an uphill battle against code coverage, <laughs> against all sorts of other understandings. I don't know if Donald's written like a blog post about it, but I feel like he did. Does anybody know? Anyway, there, I think it was the right call primarily around test coverage and, 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 just, be, and just building something testable to begin with. Um, because, yeah, what was there was, you should, if you haven't read the, the old PyPI code base, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's it's uh, very large files and there's if statements for routing and such. It's, it's interesting, to say the least. So the question is, how, how is it balanced, like old pipe, running old PyPI and developing or running new PyPI? Yeah, like yeah. The... Sure. So primarily it's balanced around uh, feature implementation. So uploads, for instance, are now feature complete for warehouse, and they're working appropriately. Um, and so it was a really simple way to say, this functionality now moves. Um, in general, the balance has really been by the way that Donald and I focus our time right now. So my, my, my main focus has really been on you know, hardening and continuing to operate uh, PyPI proper. And Donald's focus has been when, on his time when he contributes on you know, driving and, help, and helping guide the, the warehouse development. Um, so I mean, it, it, if, if, the, if the old code base is what's, is what's currently taking traffic, it, it requires a little bit more care and feeding, obviously. Um, and I think the next big phase for like, where I'm going to be considering, like thinking, is like starting to load test and and like canary traffic over to warehouse. Thank you for running PyPI for us. So the question was. <laughs> so the, the question was, thank you for running PyPI for us. Um, 
thank you for, for using Python and PyPI. So. Still more time for questions. Nope. So um, again, for uploads, uh, what's that? Oh, sorry. The question is, when is pip going to switch over to the new URL? Um, so for uploads, uh, recent versions of pip and setup tools are already using it for uploads. Uh, for installs, I don't know. I mean, I assume at some point, once we're ready, we'll, we'll switch it. Uh, or not will. The setup tools and pip maintainers will switch the URL. Um, but I think the, 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 the real plan is just to can serve everything, basically take care of it behind the scenes with the CDN and start diverting traffic. Because um, the pypi.python.org domain is not going to go away anytime soon. It's baked in, I'm sure, to all sorts of places. Um, why is that? Why is the new domain better? Like, what does that help? So the question is why is the new domain better for you and what does that help? Uh, primarily security concerns. Um, you know, again, subdomains and domains, and it's very, you have to be very careful with cookies and all sorts of other concerns around uh, TLS certificates, et cetera. Um, and so I, I, that's the primary driver. Um, and also simplicity. We don't have to sort of contend with other DNS records um, in, the, in the broader py, you know, python.org scope. Sure. Um, like I said, github.org uh, or github.com slash uh, uh, github.com slash pypa slash warehouse. Uh, you'll find an issue tracker there, and it's literally like completely uh, full of issues. There's, 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 <laughs> there's, there's, everything has been very well documented. Donald has done an excellent job. Donald and the community and, and users have done an excellent job of documenting. Uh, so it, it can be something super small. Um, you know, I'll make a change to uh, some limit in like, like you know, the, the rate limit for, for the current implementation, right? The, the, the threshold might be here. Donald is like, you need to make sure you write an issue to make sure we don't miss that. So pretty much anything from like the most minor to the most major has been documented there. And so any issue there, uh, even, if it, even if it feels really trivial, is a great way to contribute. Um, so if you check out warehouse.readthedocs.io, um, the base requirements right now are uh, a running Docker environment. So the entire, oh, so, so the entire uh, sort of local development environment can be spun up with just a single Docker composed uh, invocation. It's really awesome work by Donald. All right, I think I'm done with questions. So. <laughs>